but Michael's opinion is that it seems foolish to shut down such a clean greenhouse gas free source of power mm -hmm. uh, when we don't have other forms of energy online yet. So I think in 2016 they were thinking by the time we got to 2023 that we would uh, have more battery storage, battery storage, more, blah, blah, blah. offshore wind would be online and the leases for offshore wind were just sold this past December or last December and the permitting for those is going to take at least eight to ten years so um, again yeah Michael's opinion I feel like maybe we should have those other sources of energy online before we shut down something that's already been built and paid for mm -hmm. um, before we start tearing it down because remember that we shut the other uh, public uh, power plant utility uh, San Onofre nuclear generating station that that did shut down uh, more quickly than people thought. Um, yeah. So we they, had a, they had an incident, a mechanical incident at San Onofre, uh, we'll talk about later, that it was going to be too expensive to repair that power plant. Although if it had happened today, who knows? Right. Today, maybe they would have got right. the money to stay right. open. Right, right. right. Um, but you saw when San Onofre shut down, wholesale electrical prices uh, skyrocketed like hundreds of percent when they shut down because we had to start buying that mm. power from other areas. The issue we've seen like in 2020 is with these really large scale heat waves that affect other states like Arizona and Utah and Nevada, there's just no power to buy. Uh, it doesn't, there's, we, we can't buy it because other states need it because it gets so hot. And uh, like when we had that 2020 blackout, we were scrounging for electricity. Like we were telling in and out like, hey, turn your third fryer off. Navy ships disconnect from shore power. Uh, factories tell your workers to come in like at 10 o'clock in the in, in the evening instead of eight in the morning, stuff like that. So we could save one megawatt here, or two megawatts there. Um, we just we don't we don't have that generation capacity online for when we have these huge heat wave events um, that are seem to be a result of climate change. Um, or the grid's vulnerable because the the, the lines the transmission lines bringing into the state have to get shut down because there's a wildfire going on or something. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. We mentioned the 20 year extension, so the, the NRC's standard process for a nuclear power plant, you get a 40 year initial license and it's each unit, so unit one and two have their own licenses, then at the end of the 40 year license period, you do a 20 year extension. Mm -hmm. And So there's a lot of things they look at, they call it aging management programs, mm -hmm. where they look at critical pieces of equipment, what condition they're in, like pipelines and things like that, what's the wall thickness, have certain uh, safety devices been degraded over time. And so they, they look at all that during the 20 year extension. The state has only approved us for five years. Mm -hmm. So that legislation only extended us another five years because the state has several levers to shut us down. They have the CPUC, they provide the funding, California Public Utilities Commission. They have the California State Lands Commission has jurisdiction over our subtitle of lands. Uh, and then we also have uh, the state water board with that once through cooling process. So even though it's a federal license, the state still has a number of ways that they can kind of pull the plug on Diablo Canyon. There's no central repository for the waste, so California has enacted a couple of different laws that actually prevent building new nuclear power plants because there's no central repository. Mm -hmm. So the waste that we generate on site is stored in dry storage at the site. Uh, and there's several of those facilities, probably 50 of those facilities all around the United States. It was supposed to be stored at Yucca Mountain. The people in Nevada didn't really want that, they got really political, uh, and so that facility never opened. So. There seems to be an issue with the waste, although other countries will recycle that waste and reduce it by about 90%. We have some laws in place that sort of prevent that. And there's no industry for it either, so there's not really anywhere to send it to be recycled. But all of the fuel that we've generated, if we generated through the 40 year license period, we have a dry cast storage that would store that. It's about the size of a football field. If we could recycle that, we'd reduce that amount by about 90%. Yeah. It seems like it's like increasing the waste even more. It's, it's, right? Again, it's political and yeah. really the opponents to Diablo Canyon really mean to, they want us to choke on that waste yeah. in essence by not allowing any places to open to deal with it. But one of the themes that's sort of risen up in the last uh, few decades is we have all these very strong environmental laws, which is good, I think. Um, but what that's, uh, one of the unintended consequences of that is it's provided, it's afforded many different levers for folks that are um, not in agreement with whatever the proposal is to pull. 
and you only need to pull on one of them, right? You only only one. It could be could be sound, could be could be view shed, could be could be carbon emissions, you know, whatever it is, and that could be. In, so there's many ways to there's many ways to stop something from going in, mm -hmm. and it's it's hard to sort of uh, navigate the process to get something that, to go in, and everything is treated the same. So so a house or ecological restoration or whatever. They, we all have to go through sort of the same levels of processes, and so, um, so for folks that maybe um, were unsuccessful in, in the decision that they would like, there's ways to sort of bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed and bleed, and and maybe not you can't stop the process, but you can make it so expensive or so onerous that people are just like I'm going to give up, and so that's what um, and and that the, the clearest example of that is not nuclear power. The clearest example of that is our housing crisis in. U.S., where you look at most of the things that are denied are in relatively wealthy areas, but yet the, if, if people just said, oh, I don't want poor people here, or I don't want apartments, that would be one thing, but they'll use the environmental reasoning to sort of as a back door to accomplish mm -hmm. the same thing, and it seems to me what's, what's a better management approach is if you don't want something to happen, like, let's talk about that reason as opposed to using all these other back doors so that that makes people think that the laws are stupid or the laws are ineffectual or this is we should just throw out all the laws and be anarchy or something which is not good right mm -hmm. so so um so the nuclear power issue now is, is a, another example of of what might be a public good overall but but there are other challenges and we have to look at the holistic situation right now not like in a theoretical time but like what are our options right now whether that's housing power coastal access, whatever. If you look at it on a micro level, right, you're just looking at the discharge. Has the ecology of that discharge area changed? Absolutely. There's warm water fish species, you've got white sea bass, Garibaldi, nurse sharks, warm water kelp species that you wouldn't normally find there. A lot of those, those um, effects are limited to the discharge cove itself. So yeah, there is a change to the environment there, but it's a really small area um, and how detrimental are those changes? It, it's, it seems to be a thriving community of warm water species there. Mm -hmm. Whereas we have this issue with climate change where a car driving on the freeway, dragging a chain, can burn down you know, an entire town. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it just it seems silly to focus on something, like you're saying, you need to take a holistic approach rather than focusing in on these, these issue areas. You can find fault with really anything. Offshore wind power was one of the things that they were looking at, uh, and then wide commercial use of battery storage that you could. We are right now we have an over generation during the daytime, mm -hmm. so actually during the daytime, Diablo Canyon's power could be sold at a loss mm -hmm. depending on certain conditions um, because there's so much rooftop solar being generated. The issue is really between the hours of four and nine, so if you could bridge that gap either by uh, vehicle to grid or battery storage or offshore wind, which is usually pretty consistent, then maybe there wouldn't be a need for Diablo Canyon. But so much of this, like vehicle to grid is not being done really anywhere in California to my knowledge. I think PG&E just started a pilot program for that at one house. I'm trying it at my house, but uh, <laughs> it's like, it, all the electricians are like, you're doing what? Yeah. It's, it's very uh, new, and very new. There's very a new. lot of questions with vehicle to grid as well. It's like, if someone's charging up their, you know, can't charge your car and they're putting energy into the grid but if there's a wildfire and now your car is dead you know there's how do you what do you do to mitigate some of these issues um life cycle on a battery right number of duty cycles if you're constantly having to recharge and put power into the grid you know those batteries are ten thousand dollars a piece plus sometimes so what do you how do you compensate people for that issue um and then like i said with offshore wind power the permitting effort for that has not even begun yet and we have a pretty complex regulatory environment mm -hmm. uh, in California. So it was eight, <laughs> eight years on the East Coast. I think it took them to permit their first wind farm. I would say that's going to be quite a bit more unless we enact some legislation to say, look, now we need this now. We're going to abandon these environmental laws, kind of like what they did with some stuff for high-speed rail and things like that. All right, we had the associate director or whatever it was of the PUC come and talk. Did, you guys, did anybody go to that? Um, so they basically model energy demand in California and then model our energy production and all the new new projects that the state has endorsed and and if we if everything gets built on exactly the correct timeline we're like we're okay but 
I don't know any major <laughs> project that always hits every single timeline, everything. So that, that means we're going to have a gap. So even under the ideal conditions, it's going to be extremely close. It's close to meet our decarbonization goals uh, as it is. And, and so that was one of the key reasons why, why I guess I think it's fair to say that people wouldn't say Gavin Newsom is an advocate of nuclear power, but that that's the key one of the key reasons why there was this. We got to keep this thing on yeah. for a bit longer, at least, um, to otherwise we risk having blackouts and stuff. <laughs> well, and really, it's a public safety issue too. You have people that are on, you know, all sorts of medical equipment at home. You know, when the power right, goes yeah. out, you have to shut the power off, or you have a blackout, and people are like, you know, and if it's or if it's the middle of summer, people can't run their air conditioners. Like people are literally, you know, dying in their homes if you can't have if you don't have power. So it's a pretty it's a pretty major issue. Um, I mean, there are still several fossil fired plants um, mm. that are active in California. Um, I think that one of the I don't remember, but I think part of the joint proposal when they were talking about shutting down Diablo Canyon. Its replacement power had to be greenhouse right. gas-free energy. Right. Uh, so I don't know that it could creep in there, but we have existing facilities that can continue to operate. Mm -hmm. uh, I know during those 2020 blackouts, uh, there were some areas in LA where they were running diesel-fired um, generators, which right. is basically the dirtiest form of energy mm -hmm. you could possibly uh, produce. So it was pretty dire. So mm -hmm. I think they'd have to have something come online that's quite reliable and. People just won't stand for it being, um, you know, a greenhouse gas intensive form of energy. Mm -hmm. So when those things happen, we call those peaker plants, and so mm -hmm. those those don't have to meet the same standards as the regular plants because the idea is they're only operating like 10% of the time or emergency. And the issue is when we get in these situations where if we were to turn this off, those peaker plants would essentially all have to run as if they're regular power plants, and so they would be net contributing way more not just greenhouse gas but also air you know, pollution in the air, and they tend to be more located near marginalized communities and environmental justice communities. So there's also, not only is there the greenhouse and the pollution, but there's also the sort of equity sort of lens comes into play. Is like, is that a smart thing to do? Yeah, they do it in other countries like France and the UK. It's a, I think in the United States it was a nuclear non-proliferation issue. You, I'm not a nuclear yes. engineer, but you generate some element of plutonium when you recycle it, which is fissile material which you can use in weapons. And so I think the Carter administration had outlawed that practice. I think Reagan reversed it, um, but because there's no there's no industry to do it because there's no um, they have, people haven't been incentivized to develop that sort of industry. So the, the issue with, uh, so for a long time it was very contentious as to where to where the federal repository would be. Because remember, these things are all still federal. These, these guys have them on lease or loan or whatever the yeah, legal term is. we're stewards of the field. We don't actually own it. Stewards of it. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, you know, the idea is like down in some geological formation that's relatively stable, that doesn't have a lot of water moving through and all that kind of stuff. And so... So Yucca Mountain in uh, Nevada was our was what people sort of centered on. It was controversial for a long time, and the thing that finally blew it up was Harry Reid, the then senator who's since passed away, but the then senator became, was you know the head of the Senate, and he was a very powerful dude, and he basically said, "Not in my backyard," basically, and so um, and then when that happened, it, this is like decades of of study and decades of planning. It wasn't like there was a, a number two spot, and so we're, we're kind of back to z mm. zero with where to put it. Yeah, we're looking right now at uh, what's called consolidated, or not looking at it, but keeping an eye on consolidated interim storage. So a couple of different companies have proposed uh, storage sites in Texas and New Mexico, in like barren oil fields where not really many people are around. It's yeah. these like kind of desolate communities. Um, the thought is instead of having 50 different spent fuel storage sites around the country, you could just have one or two, and then it becomes a lot less expensive to operate. You have one security force, yeah. one set of casts that are being maintained, one pad that's being maintained, because all of the costs that are associated with our spent fuel storage area, the dry storage, is all reimbursed by the federal government, because uh, the utilities sued uh, the federal government when they didn't come through on their promise to build uh, yeah. a central repository, and so, now we as taxpayers 
you pay for spent fuel storage locations all over the country rather than just one central repository. So sending nuclear waste to other countries for recycling would probably be a pretty contentious total yeah. issue since it's an issue to send plastic you know, to other countries for recycling. I mean, right. being done uh, yeah. right. Um, yeah, so it's still divided. I mean, we have our fuel, we have two storage sites. We have one in Humboldt and we have one here at Diablo Canyon. So we pay for two. Why not just have them all at the same site, right? Yeah. Well, we can't really because the court of public opinion would sort of weigh, you know, weigh in against that. Like, why are we taking some other community's fuel, right? Why do we have to have that in our backyard? Although, Michael's opinion again, I would put one in my backyard if PG would pay me for it. <laughs> <laughs> That's how safe I feel that it is. Okay.